Test, test. Can everybody hear me? Great. <clears throat> Get started just in a few seconds. All right. So let's get things started here. Um, welcome to ASRG Worldwide Webinars, bringing you the latest in automotive research, innovation, and education. My name is John Heldreth. I'm the founder of Automotive Security Group, and I am broadcasting to you tonight from Stuttgart, Germany. Go over here. So who am I? First of all, let me quickly introduce myself. Like I said, my name is John Heldreth. I'm the founder of Automotive Security Research Group, or ASRG for short. I've worked in the automotive industry for maybe around the last 15 years or so, and now I focus my time on product or vehicle-related security. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, the 313, in the U.S. of A, but today I'm living in Germany and working at Porsche Engineering. Just quickly, I'd like to talk a little bit about Automotive Security Research Group. We are a nonprofit organization focusing on the advancement of automotive security um, research and the industry itself. This is a community to support the coming together of two areas of competencies, the IT security markets and the automotive market. This is a community for you, for the, the automotive engineer, the IT security specialist, the beginner, the expert, the hobbyist, even if you might be in the wrong um, YouTube channel. So this is a community of volunteers. Our entire organization is built on the volunteer efforts of the administrative team and, of course, people like yourself. We're trying to remove the boundaries that can occur in the automotive security industry. This could be communication, borders, finding ways to learn or different solutions, making good decisions, because at the end of the day, we all have the same goals. And this is to keep our customers, our families, our friends, data safe and secure, which can only be achieved together. If you want to get more involved, make an impact on the industry, start your own ASRG location, participate in a technical committee, be a part of a project, please reach out to us. There's always a way to learn. There's always a way to impact the industry. You can find out more about this at ASRG.io um, or send us an email at hello at ASRG.io. Very good. I just want to give you guys an update about what's going on around the world with ASRG. We now have almost 6,000 members in ASRG. I'm really happy to see that. Um, we have 40 locations worldwide in 19 countries. So um, there's usually an ASRG around the corner somewhere. But if there's not, please feel free to reach out to us if you think it makes sense to build up an ASRG community in your location. Please send us an email, get in touch with us. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about what really makes sense um, and, and how to do it. Okay. So we have some great webinars coming up this year. All right. So first of all, we have next week harmonizing cybersecurity across the automotive ecosystem with uh, Nathaniel Marone um, from C2A. Really looking forward to this one. Um, January 26th, this is a Tuesday. It's not our standard Thursday um, uh, webinars, but on a Tuesday, January 26th, um, we're going to have Cybellum with us. Guy is going to be talking about, I think it's going to be something around context filtering and how to make this relevancy um, in intelligence. So really going to be an interesting discussion there. Um, we're still confirming the title. That's why it's TBD. Then we have um, January 28th, security testing from Tara, test coverage and regression strategies with Christoph Ebert from Vector Consulting um, Services. 
really looking forward to that one as well. And then in February, I can't say exactly what it is yet because it's not confirmed, but it's going to definitely be an interesting talk as well on February 2nd. And then, of course, we have webinars planned all the way until August this year. So I really want to thank everybody that's interested to give presentations, to give these, um, these webinars, because really it's you, the, the members, the people participating that really make these webinars useful. If you do want to give a presentation, be involved in a webinar, please contact us at cfp at asrg.io. All right, and we have really a cool thing coming up. Actually, it's this weekend. I think it starts even like midnight tonight, German time. Um, is the second or the first annual ASRG Grand Prix Virtual Secure Coding Tournament. This is something we did together with Secure Code Warrior. Um, it's really cool, guys. If you haven't checked out the last one, so we did a a Grand Prix summer tournament. This is the first winter tournament. And if you haven't checked this out yet, this is really cool, okay? You um, basically, you log into the platform, you do have to register and all that stuff, but it does get you access to, you know, the learning portal. And then they have these really great challenges, you know, and you really go through code and it really lets you learn what means secure coding check it out. Okay. Check it out. It's on our LinkedIn page. There's a link there. It's pinned to the top. So everybody has quick access to it. All right. There is also one more announcement I wanted to bring forth for you guys today. Um, the SCAR, SCAR USA. If you guys don't know SCAR, this is the place to be. So this is where all the really good professional um, talks are given every year. Um, they have Europe, they have US, I think there's also a China or a Japan as well. Um, but SCAR is looking for or has opened up their CFP for the USA. And this is always really interesting. The, the best research is always presented at these conferences. So check it out. I assume this year it's going to be virtual. Someone just texted me right now. So check it out, SCAR USA 2021, okay? And if you're interested to give a presentation, check out the CFP. All right, so without further ado, I really, I you know, you've, uh, you've seen Gilad Bandel here at ASRG before, and it's always my pleasure to introduce him. Today, I have the pleasure of also introducing Gil um, Lich ever, um, Gilad, when I don't say that correctly, you're going to have to <laughs> correct me. Um, but they're going to be talking about J1931 today. And this is a protocol that we'll get into used in the heavy duty industry. And they're going to be talking about how to secure this. Okay. Really interesting talk. So, um, Gilad, without further ado, I would hand it over to you, sir. Thank you, John. Um, in this presentation, Gil Lichiver, our CTO, uh, will have the middle section of the presentation and obviously the interesting one, more interesting one. So uh, looking forward for that section because he goes really drill down into vulnerabilities and things uh, he uh, and his team were able to found in their cyber research. Um, so let's start with um, with this session. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Gilad Bandel. Uh, I serve as VP Product and Marketing uh, for Arilo. It's an honor and a pleasure to um, be here on ASRG. This is not the first time and definitely I hope not the last time. We have some more exciting uh, presentation upcoming and the only uh, problem is finding a time slot. Uh, as you understood, this is a very, very busy uh, schedule for ASRG. So today we're going to speak about the heavy duty vehicles uh, 
the happy duty TV vehicles are using the SAE J1939 protocol. So I'm going to go over the protocol uh, architecture, I'm not going to go into the bits and bytes. So to understand how the standard is built, uh, what are the influences of the protocol, uh, Gil is going to go deep down into how uh, software and the protocol can be uh, exploited um, and how we can find vulnerabilities and exploitation that can harm the vehicle. And in the last section, uh, because you will all be tense that uh, uh, you are under risk, I will try to give you some uh, directions regarding the uh, solutions that we have. Uh, John, if you may uh, mute yourself because there's some background noise, thank you. So, why do we need uh, to address the J1939? What, why isn't it just a canvas? Uh, why does it need a different approach? So, the uh, J1939 is a protocol used um, for heavy duty vehicles. Uh, it is based on the canvas uh, of the hardware and the basis of the protocol, but it has some differences. So for every problem, there is a specific solution. Uh, as we don't in, uh, use IT uh, approaches and IT protocols in the automotive, uh, so goes the difference between passenger vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. So for passenger vehicles, CAN bus used to be uh, the protocol of the choice. Uh, for the heavy duty vehicles, the J1939 uh, evolved. Along the presentation, I will give you some, uh, some links and also the presentation will be shared by, the, uh, by John, by the SRG afterwards, and you can find it also on, on our web. Um, and you can go to those links that appear beneath uh, specifically, this is an article, a set of articles in which I compare the IT industry, the industrial control system, it's called ICS CADA industry, which is similar to our industry because it goes to operation technologies, uh, and the automotive industry um, from different perspective on the cybersecurity. Uh, and trying to give some predictions of what will happen in our industry based on the ICS CADA, which is about four or five years ahead of us, and IT, which is about 30 years ahead of us. So uh, you're welcome to uh, read this article. I hope you will find it interesting. We got very positive feedback from people that read it. So let's look into the SAJ1939 um, architecture. And from then we go to the cybersecurity. So the SAJ1939 is a five layer protocol. Uh, try to do something mimicking the uh, ISO seven layer protocol, uh, implementing five layers, not exactly the same layers as the uh, ISO, but uh, it has some architecture and some layering in it. Uh, going from bottom up, we start from the individual ECU, going into the in vehicle network. Uh, electrical and electronic architecture, uh, connectivity, and the fleet. Uh, each one of those things have specifications that define how they should work and have the associate uh, security uh, standards and derivatives. Specifically speaking, we will focus today on the SAJ 1939-91, which is a uh, Standard still in work, uh, so it's not a uh, completed standard, but we can give some insights of what's written there, and we can speak about what should be there in general. Uh, furthermore, we will focus mainly on the in vehicle network uh, because this is the place where we find the most vulnerabilities, and we think that this is a place where uh, most of the attention should be given. And uh, this is the place where you would like to stop an attack uh, more or less uh, before it, it uh, hurts the vehicle. So looking at the architecture, let's look at the uh, overall concept and the parts. So one part of the 
story is the vehicle itself with all the ECUs. So this is one area that we need to address. The second area is the telematics. In general, all the connected uh, devices from our perspective are uh, part of the attack surface and they should be addressed separately uh, and they should be regarded as a, a threat factor. Uh, the same goes with uh, TPMS, Bluetooth, key fob, Wi-Fi, uh, any cellular connectivity, uh, and it can be even a physical thing like uh, an OBD attachment, a, a insurance company dongle or a testing equipment that uh, that is plugged into the vehicle in the in the workshop. So if we look at the architecture, the architecture starts from the vehicle inside, telematics, uh, and then we go into the cloud and the management system and, and other uh, other parts. Uh, Gil, can you please shut down the um, camera? Thank you. Uh, looking into the uh, protocols and relevant protocols that we are looking at, uh, and the, the standards, sorry, looking at the standard and trying to map those standards um, to those layers. So layer one will speak about the individual ECU. Uh, there are two standards which um, address this. We're not going to go into those things because they are less of, of an interest. Uh, layer two is addressed by J1939 uh, part C. Don't ask me why part C comes uh, before part A, which comes after, uh, uh, ABC is not necessarily the right order. Uh, so layer two is um, is addressed by uh, J1931-91 part C. Uh, the cybersecurity of layer three is addressed by uh, part one, so the electric and electronic architecture uh, is addressed by part one. And the com communication with the cloud, uh, with the telematics is addressed by part uh, B. So this is layer four. So if we look at the four layers, the physical layer, uh, the in-vehicle network layer, the electronic architecture and the outside of the cloud, each one of them have an associated uh, um, standard which uh, describe the security related to that uh, layer, uh, we will focus today on layer two in vehicle. But let's go over the rest of the uh, standard so we have an overview, a good overview. Uh, looking at layer one, this is the individual ECU. So here we speak about how we protect the individual ECU in terms of secure memory, secure play, secure Flash, secure boot, and so on. Um, authorization, authentication, some keys, things like this. So this is uh, addressed by two standards, the ISO 14.221.229-1 and the SAJ 3101. If you want to learn more about secure boot and secure boot solutions, you're welcome to follow the link uh, beneath today, this is not part of our talk. Be more than happy to speak about secure boot in another time, but today we're just going to skip this. Looking at layer two, this will be the focus of our talk today. Uh, this defines recommendation for the onboard communication uh, regarding the network. So there is the standard which speaks about the communication and J1939 part C speaks about the cyber security and protection um, of this layer. Going to the next layer, um, we find part A. This speaks about the architecture in the, in the network. So there is the J1939 uh, 13 interface, which uh, defines how things should work in the vehicle. And there is the J1939 19 part A, which speaks about how to protect those things. So you'll find in many cases that there is the standard which speaks about how to implement the layer and the associated standard, which um, explains how to protect that layer. 
something about uh, history and approaches in cybersecurity today. Today we speak about uh, secure by design. Uh, secure by design means that the moment that you design something, you also include the security in the design. Uh, for J1939, this is not the case. Uh, first, the protocol and the standard was uh, uh, published, and only later the security was added to it. And as I said, this is still work in progress, uh, so this, this is not finalized yet. So we have a standard which works, but the security uh, parts of it are not yet finalized. Going to the uh, next ver next layer, uh, this is the connectivity layer, the telematics and all the communication outside. Uh, this is part B of J1939-19. Uh, uh, it relates to many other standards like intelligent transportation system, extended vehicles and so on. Speaks about V2X, DSRC. Uh, important to mention, uh, ISO SAE 21434. This is a very large, broad uh, standard. Um, it covers more things than uh, part uh, B. Uh, and this is one of the must do to comply with the uh, WP29, uh, UNEC WP29, UN regulation, UN, uh, UNR. Um, 155. So whoever wants to have a certification for a vehicle as of 2022, uh, 21.434 is the way to do it. Uh, regarding our resources, uh, an interesting article uh, that appeared a few weeks on telematics wire uh, regarding TCU protection, uh, the battle on two fronts because you have one front on the outside, the other front on the inside, because this is a connected ECU. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, follow this link and uh, read this article. Focusing on what we're going to speak today, we're speaking, going to speak today on the IV and cybersecurity. This is covered by uh, part C of the protocol. We're going to speak here about what needs to be done and ways to attack it and vulnerabilities that we found. I'm not going to go through the lines of the uh, standard. I think everyone can read it once it will be published. Right now it's not published anyway, so uh, we can just um, speak about it in general. So who are the threat actors? Uh, for every type of um, technology, network, organization, uh, things change. So things that we find in the IT do not appear in the automotive. And things that appear in the uh, vehicle, passenger vehicle, are not necessarily the same as the uh, heavy duty. So who would attack us? Um, criminals. Uh, it can be a ransomware attack, such as um, trying to put a fleet, stop it in it, in its tracks uh, and ask for ransom to release this uh, this um, uh, this fleet or individual vehicles uh, collection of information um, regarding movements who moves where what and so on uh, it can even go to inflicting physical damage that means that if i am able to take over a uh, bus packed with uh, children and drive it off a bridge into the icy waters beneath, killing everyone on board, uh, this would be a, uh, a terrible effect of a cyber, uh, cyber attack. Uh, luckily, it didn't happen yet, but definitely can happen. Uh, terrorists and nation states. Uh, this would be something of a strategic uh, case, like uh, let's think a case that two nations go to war and they try to mobilize their reserves forces and to bring everyone to the concentration um, places. You need uh, buses 
and one nation is able to uh, attack the uh, fleet of the buses and uh, stop them. This will make life very hard for the nation that tries to bring everyone together and will give a an edge to the opponent. So this is a case that uh, it's, it's clear, even going one step ahead, uh, if the war already broke and I'm able to uh, do some damage to tanks or to other armored vehicles and prevent them from shooting or prevent them from moving, uh, this is the wet dream of any adversary in the field. Another case which is more specific to vehicles are the owners themselves or the end users. Uh, Chinese uh, ECUs, cloned ECU, ECU replacement uh, workshops that want to reuse uh, cheap ECUs and might want to clone them. Um, chip tuning in which you might take a vehicle, uh, tune the chips of the engine will provide more power than it is supposed to and will cause damages. And one week before the warranty is over, you come to the workshop and uh, ask for replacement because the engine is already dead. And this uh, inflicts huge financial damages on the um, OEM because they just need to fix fix those engines. And the only reason they need to fix it because someone did some cheap tuning. So those are the uh, main threat uh, actors that we can think about. Uh, there might be more, but those are the main ones. Let's look at the attack services. Uh, as any vehicle, the preferred uh, attack would be remote. Uh, generally speaking, remote attacks are preferred. Uh, but uh, it can be also um, using routine uh, maintenance. Uh, that means you have a physical access to the, to the vehicle. So in the workshop, this can happen. Uh, my claim is that if you gain a physical access to a vehicle, uh, it's easier to plant a bomb under the seats than do some cybersecurity attack, but not necessarily the uh, target of the attack is uh, killing someone. So um, planting some software or delayed software or ransom, it, it, it's, it's an interesting case. Uh, standardization in J1939 is a wonderful thing. Uh, because it's the same protocol, the same DBC from every for everyone, uh, as opposed to the passenger vehicles in which each OEM tries to paint their own Mona Lisa and have their own DBC, and no two DBCs are the same, and every ECU is tailor made for each uh, make and model. Uh, this is not the case with J1939. So the protocol is standardized, the DBC is standard, um, ECUs can be um, interchange between uh, cars, that means that it's much easier uh, to create an attack because things repeat and they are the same and they are standard. So it's a larger, much larger population that I can attack once I have one attack scenario because it can work for three, four OEMs that, that are using the same ECU as opposed to uh, passenger vehicles in which no two issues are, are alike, even not uh, within one OEM. So uh, obscurity is not security, but in this case, obscurity with multiple uh, issues and uh, diversity of protocols um, has a edge in security for the passenger vehicles and uh, poses a a threat for the heavy duty J1939 um, vehicles. So this is, those are the attack surfaces, the, the threat models. Uh, another thing that we need to take into consideration is the fact that uh, heavy duty vehicles are Lego and you uh, mix and match and you can blend and you can detach and attach things. 
So imagine that I was able to uh, infect one device uh, which is used for agriculture. Uh, that means that that device is going to use by many vehicles because today it is attached to one um, tractor and the other day to another one. Uh, same goes with the trailer, which can be uh, shared and moved between many uh, many vehicles. That means that uh, very similar to the COVID-19, the viral uh, effect here is very intense due to the fact that if you don't have a protection mechanism, once you infected one device, it is very easy uh, to infect the full fleet due to the fact that um, they change partners every day. So this way you can get one virus being spread in a fleet in a very, very short time. Uh, looking at attack scenarios and attack vectors, uh, if we look at the protocol itself, the J1939, which is based on the CANBAS, uh, uses a, a very easy to impersonate uh, protocol. So everyone can uh, send a message, any issue can send any message. Uh, there is no real authentication there. And many in the middle uh, scenario is also possible. Uh, and as I said, the vehicle configuration is dynamic. Every day you attach a different attachment to the to the um, to the head, and you end up with uh, an infected fleet. So this is um, with regard to the attack scenarios. Another thing that we should take into account is the fact that the aftermarket uh, is huge. Is much much more. Uh, extensive than the passenger vehicles and you do not control who is selling you uh, and what is the source and you cannot verify the source of the uh, additional device that you just added to your bus or to the replacement that you uh, that you used so this is another source of uh, attacks by supply chain by uh, using uh, sources of software and hardware that you cannot control. So it's not in the OEM hands, it's in the uh, third party supplier. And again, as I said, it can be um, very dangerous because it's not under controlled environment that the OEM can control. Uh, last thing is um, specific embedded software issues. Uh, they appear everywhere. You can find them in any vehicle, but due to the fact that the same code is shared among many ECUs and the same ECU is shared among many uh, vehicles and many OEMs, you end up with one vulnerability in many, many, many places. So this was my introduction. Uh, I hand over now to Gil that will uh, introduce himself and uh, speak about the vulnerabilities and the code and things that we found uh, just to prove that what we speak is not in theory, but in practice, things that we found ourselves. Um, Gil, um, over to you. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Gil. I'm a CTO and a co-founder of uh, Arrow Technologies. A second. Okay. Now, uh, John, can you please share my screen? Yeah, Gil, you're you're all set. Uh, this is not my. Uh, this is Gilad's screen, I think. A second. Do you see my screen? Uh, section five of the presentation. Just one second here. I'll just switch over to you. So do you, uh, you're showing the zero five, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Then we see your screen. You can go Excellent. right ahead. 
Excellent. So, as I said, my name is Gil. I'm a CTO and co-founder in Arlu. We're going to go now a bit more on the technical side and things we found in vulnerabilities we found inside J1939. Unlike other approaches that you just look at the protocol, we looked at specific code. So, how we approach this? First of all, uh, for this presentation specifically, I just we took some code uh, uh, from the internet, from the public domain, and this is a code that was used for educational purposes. Uh, and you may actually have it or base your code on it. Uh, the results of our inspection, well, from simple taking over the communication flow, uh, without the knowledge of the parties, we'll go over in details what the difference between here and what we have in normal can, denial of service, buffer overflow, more than just one, and we have actually several more attacks, but they're not interesting enough. They differentiate, not, do not teach us anything new. I mean, there are just more vulnerabilities in this code. Uh, for more details, please visit our article where we uh, go into more details of what we have inside our uh, the found vulnerabilities. As for effort, uh, it took about two days for deobfuscating the code and then do the vulnerability assessment and writing the report. This is not... Uh, difficult, uh, difficult code to go over, okay? Uh, for some reason, the author of the code decided to obfuscate it. Actually, making it a bit easier to present it right now because we don't show his actual code, but us, us the obfuscating the code. And as always, uh, first of all, when it comes to obfuscating code, specifically when you do something educational, open source, security for obscurity doesn't care. Even if you put out the library, I mean, we'll reverse engineer it if needed, but then it will be more, more difficult for anyone to use it because you don't know where the vulnerabilities are if you're not a hacker. J1939, and this is part of the reason this was not difficult to uh, find the vulnerabilities, is well documented. Um, it's fast, it's easy, it is, uh, you can, it's a standard, it's very nice. Unlike uh, when you go over a, a code that was written specifically for that, uh, by that OEM or T1, here you know what to look for. So, uh, as a conclusion, the, the usual conclusion is do not take your code off the internet without checking or using someone who can help you with that. And there is a good reason we call this general pitfalls. Okay, uh, I do not, uh, um, I, have no, I will not go into details of other things we found here, uh, not in the current presentation. Uh, this specific code is something that we can more easily go over. Okay, a bit. we're going to go a bit technical, so I remind, of, I remind us of several acronyms we're going to use here. Uh, if you know this, uh, this is just a reminder. If not, just going to go very fast. So, BAM, this is Broadcast Announcement Message. TP stands for Transfer Protocol. CM, Connection Mode, Messages actually. DT, data transfer messages, PGN, parameter group number, RTS and CTS, as in other uh, standards, request to send and clear to send, and SN will be used for sequence number. So how does a frame look? Well, we're using standard CAN or actually 29-bit CAN ID type of CAN, where the, uh, the ID is used to transmit part of our parameters. So the 18 bits, eight, there are 18 bits used uh, to describe what type of uh, message we're going to have. This is the PGN. We have the, PG, uh, the PDU format and the PDU specific part. For some messages, it is uh, the PDU specific will be the target address. And for some, it will be a 16 bit of, okay, this is the type of message we have. And it's well defined in the, uh, in the standard what is what. And of course, there are some, there are places where you can put whatever you like. I mean, for some PDUs, okay, this is user defined. Then the last eight bits are used for source addressing. Okay, so this is a standard CAN message um, 29, with a 29 bit, bits ID. And let us remember, everyone can send whatever message he, he wants. No authentication, nothing. I can send whatever I like with the source, with the PGN. I choose it. A uh, nice thing that J1939 adds to the, your standard CAN, it adds a transport layer. And that's important for many applications because eight bytes is not a lot. This is the, not the only 
transport protocol you'll find for CAN, you'll find it also for diagnostics or other implementations. Um, they're not very, I mean, they're quite similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, usually, I mean, for this transport uh, uh, protocol, the first byte uh, is used uh, for uh, the sequence number. Okay, so this is uh, very important to remember. We're going to use that a lot. Two uh, parts of the protocol uh, we're going to look at, and we will not look, by the way, about the dynamic addressing. We're just going to look at things that uh, use the transport protocol. So we have two types of transport protocol. One is broadcast using the BAM message. So in this case, the sender is sending uh, uh, an announcement. This is the message I'm going to I'm going to send. Right. This is the message I'm sending. This is the PGN of the internal message, and then it will send all the data. There's no ax here. No one needs to acknowledge he got that message. This is broadcast message. You cannot wait for everyone to acknowledge it. Another option is a peer-to-peer -peer message. Here, we send the connection mode message, first of all, requests to send, and then we get an acknowledge from our target. We have, of course, the destination address here, right? And then we send message according to uh, uh, the agreed uh, uh, way we're going to speak. In this case, two consecutive messages and then two acts, two uh, uh, clear to send messages. Okay, so these are two protocols, uh, two, two parts of the protocol uh, we're going to... Uh, exploit actually actually in our uh, uh, system in our attack okay so some general pitfalls in the code we're going to look at two parts one um, common flaws in this case is using the the sequence number in the wrong manner without doing a sanity check and we should Keep in mind that the sequence number is used to decide what part of the message should be copied right now. So, and it's always should be larger than zero and smaller than 255. And you should have a large enough buffer to send it there. And you, and you should validate everything. Uh, all of this is part of, say, the, uh, the basic thing you need to do when you look at uh, a transport layer, specifically when you get a pointer or an index from the communication. The second part, which is not less straightforward, is the state machine and timeouts and decisions. Uh, as we saw, this is a complex protocol. You have handshakes, they start working. This is a small embedded system. You don't have a large protocol stack with all the... Uh, this is not Linux, right? This is embedded. So sometimes you need to make a decision. You do not get the message, you get a message twice. What do you do? And here, the solution is not always straightforward. Uh, you can make a decision that will easily create another attack. You can easily create a denial of service by just making a wrong decision. Uh, by solving an, one problem, we create another. So we'll go over uh, also on one of these attacks uh, where it is clear what uh, whoever wrote this code should have done in this case. Well. Let's uh, st let's start at the beginning. Machine override, and why do I mean by that? Usually, when I attack a can uh, a vehicle, a can bus of a vehicle, and let's say I want to override a message, let's say I want to convince one ECU that my speed is a different speed. So one of the things I can do, I can send the speed message very fast. Uh, so if it is the last message that ECU that wanted to needs that information looked at, okay, it will get that message. But then again, I have the original sender sending the same message. So you get some jitter. If you look at the, the needle, the speed needle, you see it jumping up and down. So that is something that, first of all, is very problematic. As an attacker, usually what I do, I either shut down the original sender by getting into diagnostic mode, or if I have physical access, this is just for testing, I will drop it out completely by invalidating its messages. Here it's much simpler in this case. I can do the same attack. Uh, I don't need to send fast messages. Uh, I can just convince everyone that everything is okay. So this is a virtual man in the middle attack. No one knows that I actually send a message uh, instead of someone else. What I will do is this. I will uh, anticipate a bum message someone needs to send. These are periodic message. I know where he's going to send it. 
So uh, before he sends it, I'm going to send it with the double the number of packets. I have a field saying how many packets I'm going to send, and this is the field that is going to be checked. Then I'm going to wait for the original sender to send all of its messages and all of the data. I mean, first of all, the BAM, and then all of the data. And then I'm going to send again my messages with the index starting from 1, with six sequence numbers starting from 1. The system will allow that. So if when I finish it, I get all the messages. Right? The receiver gets all the messages. He'll, he got, he knew that he should expect the double number of messages. He gets all of these messages. The second part is me sending these messages, not the original sender. And then it will stop. It understands that, okay, this is enough. I got enough messages. And uh, in this case, it will overwrite the original, the original sender. Uh, if we look at the code here, uh, we see that there's no validation on the uh, pointer. Here we get the first byte of the message where we have the sequence number and we get the pointer from there. I can go back, I can do whatever I like. And then I look the number on the number of packets and here I decide, okay, I got the right number of packets. Me as an attacker, I decided the number of packets. The second RTS message is ignored. And that is something that is a bit problematic. That means that we have a way in and uh, we can actually override everything. So there are several bad things that happened here. And uh, so many things that should be validated before allowing something like this to happen. First of all, the bound message contains both the number of frames and the message length. You should probably validate that it's way, way off. It's like twice the number of frames for the message length. Uh, also, if this is a known PGN, uh, it's a known message, you should know how many frames should be there. Also, just getting the sequence number, and this is uh, something that we saw over and over again, not in just this code. Uh, just using the sequence number from the outside without validating it, there should be no reorder in these types of messages, okay? It should be straightforward. It should go forward. It should not start again from one. So this should be validated, something that should not happen. Now, as I said, in this case, it is quite straightforward what should have been done. Um, another type of uh, uh, attack, this one sends uh, the, uh, uh, this one uses the state machine. This is not a coding or non, I mean, not validating specific data. This is more of how you handle earnest parts in the state machine where you get a message twice. Now, it's not that the NAV service was not demonstrated on J1939. This is a bit different. Also, it's very easy to avoid in this case. We'll define a PTP session. Now, this uh, a session requires an RTS. The receiver should send a clear to send message, meaning, okay, I saw your message, now you can send. What happens in our case is that the receiver, I mean the sender, not the receiver, the receiver of the CTS message sees a CTS message and says, okay, after I get the CTS, I'm going to wait a timeout and then I'm going to start sending the messages. Me as an attacker, when I see a, a, an RTS message, I'm going to send a CTS message repeatedly. And what happens? Uh, if you look at the code, if it received a CTS, this is a co the code snippet, it receives a CTS message again, it will, uh, uh, it will um, reset the counter. Okay, sorry, this in, the, in this part. So we're going to reset the, pipe, uh, the, the counter, the timeout, and we're going to wait again and again and again every time we get a CTS message what will happen is the receiver, the actual receiver, the original RTS message will time out and send a message. And in this case, I will just do a denial of service uh, for the original sender. And this time you cannot send any uh, uh, transport layer type of messages, uh, not BAM and not the uh, PTP. So we stop him for sending anything. So that's, in this case, it's quite straightforward what should have been done and that when you get another CTS message, just ignore it. Not, do not reset the timer again. And he did. Okay, now to the fun part. Buffer overflow. And actually, code execution uh, in one of the attacks. 
in a system like a vehicle system, the memory is statically allocated. We should not expect a buffer overflow. It shouldn't happen. And uh, um, that's a very dangerous thing. This is not just saying to one ECU, okay, this is what you should do. In this case, this is just taking over the execution. Uh, just for an example, let's say that I uh, do a supply chain attack, I give you some, I know that I'm going to sell you some equipment that's going to attack you or anyone else who uses this type of uh, uh, type of uh, code. And what would it will allow me is to run code on your ECU once I do the attack. So that's much more dangerous than just your average, okay, I'll send some messages that shouldn't be there. Um, in this case, we have two buffer overflows. The first one is the fact that for BAM or PTP messages, we said, if you remember, the sequence number should not start with zero, it should start with one, right? If you take this number, the number of bytes we're supposed to send, allowed to send, the buffer size, it's seven times 255. It not, it's not seven times 256. So what will happen in our code here? Let, let's look in this part, and then go back. Right, so this is where I I'll calculate where I'm gonna go in my buffer. This is the end pointer, and then I copy it. And what happens is that I take the sequence number, reduce it by one, and then it's time seven. Now the question is, what is int? And how the compiler will look at it? Uh, the surprising part is that it's, of course, signed in this case. And what it does, it, it goes to a negative address. By the way, in this case, it's a good thing because it goes it goes to a negative address and you can try it yourself. You can compile code with negative addresses. It is allowed in C and it will not wrap around to the front of your buffer. It will go back. So in this case, it will overrun three bytes of the PGN, the source address, destination address, the number of packets, and the frame number of the current session. Not too bad in this case. Uh, in this attack, I, we could not run, uh, uh, we, could, we did not exploit it to run uh, malicious code. If it was unsigned int, uh, well, we've copied, we, we could have copied seven bytes into the area where we have uh, the session length variable. And then we can copy a lot of, a lot of data. That's very bad. Uh, in this case, it's not as bad, but still not the way it should work. Um, it will do some damage, but uh, uh, not trivial to run a uh, 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 bad code from here. Well, the simplest mitigation is your sequence number should start from one, not from zero. Now, the second buffer overflow, well, it's a fine thing. Uh, the J1939 stack uh, many times expects to get the maximal frame size of uh, uh, 1,785 bytes. That's a lot for an embedded system, especially when you have more than one uh, for sending and receiving uh, for BAM and PTP. So when you run it specifically here, it was for Arduino or something very, very small. The frame size was 256 bytes. Mm, that's a bad thing. So this is still the same code. We still rely on the fact that we just get the sequence number from the outside. We take this number and we use it. This number could go much, much further than your 256 byte buffer. And uh, what it creates is the fact that we overwrite 1529 bytes. This is code execution. It applies to both BAM and PTP messages. Uh, by the way, these things do not only apply, as I said, to J1939. We saw similar things in other transport protocol implementations. Um, it is, uh, again, a repeated problem we saw in, uh, in, in the code. How do, you valid, how do you mitigate it? Again, validate your sequence number. You know how big is your buffer. Another problem that we have here, and this is, uh, again, the, uh, uh, when, when you want to go the extra mile and you have to do it, this is like off by one. Uh, if we just go for the number of buffers, number of frames we're going to use, this is not a multiple of 200, I mean, seven times 36 is not 256. This is 239, 59. 
So we have three bytes we can overrun again. So we need to make sure in the last copy that we know do not go over uh, the buffer size either way. Uh, so uh, this is about how we should protect it. Let's go over a bit again about uh, do's and don'ts. First of all, security through obscurity doesn't work. You can put it in a library. It's uh, actually, uh, for hackers, it's sometimes easier in some sense because you don't know what you have there, even from functionality perspective. Obfuscating it, again, doesn't work, doesn't help. That's easier than reverse engineering. Since J1939 is well documented, it's easy to find vulnerabilities. It's easy to attack because everyone uses the same type of systems. You can do supply chain attacks. You can do a lot of uh, widespread attacks. Don't take your code without checking. Do not copy your code from somewhere. And if you think that, uh, uh, I mean, if you don't know where your programmers uh, took the code from, if they copied it, write it, written it themselves. Also, another problem, sometimes they don't do it very good. Make sure you do it correctly. This is a very dangerous place to be where you have an embedded system with indexes, indexes you get from the outside world. Uh, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, this is my email, and I turn it back to uh, Gilad right now. Thank you. Hi there, John. Just let me know when I can start to speak. Okay, so Gil, thank you very much. Um, this was a very deep uh, dive. Uh, I hope that some of you were able to follow um, all the things that Gil said, even if you did not manage to follow the bits and bytes. Um, the main important thing here is to understand that there are vulnerabilities in code. Uh, human beings are writing the code and uh, we cannot rely that there will no be there will be no bugs and no vulnerabilities uh, in the code. So right now, if anyone is leaving us, uh, that's a pity because you will not be able to sleep at night. You will have nightmares and you will dream all night about all those um, disasters that can happen in your uh, vehicle. So in the next few slides, I will try to give you some solutions and some ways how to cope with this situation and how to sleep better at night uh, knowing that your uh, fleet and your vehicles are uh, better protected from those uh, potential calamities. So, a few things that you need to do. Even if you are an OEM, a tier one, a fleet owner, uh, a tier two doesn't matter. You need to follow those things. So you need to take proactive action. Why you need to take proactive action? Action for many reasons. And frankly, I don't care what is the reason that you take this action as long as you do take it and try to take it uh, in the most mature and uh, professional fashion. It's not just to, to have a check mark on the, yes, I did something, but it needs to be really good. So one thing is regulation. Uh, the UN EC WP29, there were an infinite number of uh, webinars, presentation about these things. So uh, I hope that everyone is already uh, well acquainted with this thing. Uh, the NHTSA issued a new document in the US. It's only best practices. Uh, it's open for comments. Uh, I read this document, it's not the uh, most detailed and uh, down to the bits uh, document that you can think about and it's not binding in the US but still if you want to sell from the US a vehicle to Europe it needs to go through certification so the UNEC is the guideline um, for everything uh, even without the certification a growing number of people are aware of the the threats 
and take action. It can be the CISO, it can be the VP engineering, it can be the director of cyber security in the automotive, uh, but people in the industry are taking action and are locating resources and are making the right steps in the direction. Uh, another very important person in the company is the CEO who likes very much uh, the chair and the paycheck and doesn't want anything to harm this thing. Uh, and obviously not harm the firm reputation. Uh, because if you lose property, lose life because of a cybersecurity attack and you are liable to it, um, it costs a lot, a lot, a lot. So it's a good idea to prevent it ahead of time. Another uh, force in the industry is the insurance companies, which need to measure the risk. So they ask you to do a TARA, a threat assessment risk analysis uh, process, so they can measure what is the risk. And as you are asked to have a lock on your door, uh, same go with the cybersecurity, they ask you to place cyber security protection measures in your vehicle. So those are the major uh, powers in the industry which drive cyber security ahead. Uh, and it's working. Uh, 2022, 2024 are the decisive years in which things will be in masses like every vehicle. Uh, the main thing that you want to do is to reduce the risks. So there are best practices. Uh, there's a European best practice. There's the uh, NITSA uh, best practice. Uh, there's the AUTOSA best, pract best practice. There is a standard, the ISO SAE 21434, which is the cookbook of how to comply with the uh, WP29. Uh, in practice, you need to have procedures and processes, and you have to have a cybersecurity team, and management needs to be involved into this thing. And the process, and you need to go through standards like MISRA and uh, ASPICE. Uh, and you need to have a dedicated mechanism that is looking at the cybersecurity in addition to the secure by design, and in addition to the process, in addition to the supply chain, you need someone who the only job they have when they wake up in the morning is to look at the cyber security. So it, it, it can be the endpoint protection, for example, it's a dedicated thing. It can be the intrusion detection, intrusion prevention uh, system. Those things are separate, they are independent, they are devoted, they are dedicated. Um, so the IDS IPS, in my view, is the thing that you need to implement in the, in the gateway, which is the best place to implement because there you have all the traffic and you have visibility to all the buses. Uh, if it's automotive ethernet, then obviously the switch or the firewall, the, or the, the uh, connected gateway is the place to, to have this uh, software running uh, on the connected devices, on the V2X LBU, uh, on the IVI, on the TCU, those are the places where you need some intrusion detection uh, and intrusion prevention. Uh, this is the only way to have the best provision, pro protection provided um, to the vehicle. Um, in terms of how we can assist, um, we have experience with J1939. Uh, we have a product, an IDS IPS called Sentinel TRK, uh, which performs the IDS IPS function. Uh, we have other products which are uh, also in the cybersecurity area uh, for CAN bus, for automotive Ethernet, uh, and so on. You're more than welcome to see us and see our solutions, uh, which can provide a very, very good uh cyber security protection for the SAJ1939 specifically as we saw today there are many risks and vulnerabilities and exposures there and in general for the in vehicle um, cyber security so at this point i'd like to thank everyone for listening i'd like to thank thank gil for his uh very deep 
and professional section. Uh, and I hand it over to you, John, if there are any questions from the audience, I'd be more than happy to ask, to, to answer uh, either me or, or Gil. Probably it will be more uh, addressed to Gil because he's the uh, more technical professional guy. Uh, mm -hmm. But in any case, we're both here to answer questions. So are, are there any questions from the audience by any chance? All right. Um, first of all, Elad Gill, thank you very much for such a nice presentation here. Um, this is really an important topic and something that uh, we use in, in everyday life. Every uh, truck is using this protocol, correct? Yeah, so J1939 is used um, by trucks, by agriculture equipment, but not only. For example, we saw a case in which a uh, OEM using uh, passenger vehicles uh, required the transport protocol and the CAN bus transport protocol was not good enough. So for that purpose only, they used in a passenger vehicle uh, J1939. So we can find it in other automotive industries. Uh, mainly it is for the heavy duty vehicles uh, because this is, uh, the thing that it was designed for, but not only, as I said. And you mentioned something really interesting as well, is that uh, tractors and uh, agricultural equipment, construction equipment, this, they're all using J1939 as well. Yes, this is correct. And um, it's not only things on wheel. Uh, that go on the road. It can be off-road, it can be construction equipment, uh, it can be in railways, uh, in, in trains, uh, agriculture equipment especially. Uh, the thing that damage. worries us, a lot, of, a lot damage. of damage. It's heavy duty, like if you if you are able to compromise a passenger vehicle and you crash it into a, into a wall, the damage is uh, limited more or less to, to, to the passengers of the vehicle. Uh, yeah. If you're able to take a, a full trailer or a semi-trailer and crash it, uh, uh, the damage is huge. Um, mm -hmm. So those are heavy duty vehicles, which uh, if compromised, uh, imply lots of uh, damage. Another thing which is unique to those devices is that uh, you have a mix and match of components. So uh, the potential, as I said, to spread the virus in a fleet is immense due to the fact that there is no 100% uh, binding of all the components. Every new component attached to a agriculture equipment or to a um, to a heavy duty vehicle. Mm -hmm. That means that if you infected one thing and you're able to spread the virus, the malware, through uh, the network, then in no time you have one full fleet. Uh, infected. Okay. Um, Gilad is um, so. Bill is asking: Is J nineteen thirty nine used also in trains and planes as well? Do you know that? Uh, less in planes. Uh, planes have other other uh, other uh, protocols. Um, trains, as far as I know, very few. So there are some devices in trains that are using J1939. Uh, but our focus and the security should be, in my view, first of all, aimed at mm. things on wheels, um, either on the road, first of all, things which are on the road, the second thing which are off-road, and last thing would be on uh, on rails. Uh, yes, you can inflict damage on rails, uh, but there are many other mechanisms, safety mechanisms uh, there, and uh, it's very hard to take a, a, a train off the uh, trails and drive it to the center square, uh, as opposed to a, a full trailer or a semi-trailer, which is very easy to drive into the city center square and uh, cause their damages. So we have to prioritize in life and we work by uh, severity and uh, probability of a 
risk to happen. And if we multiply those two um, and find where they are most severe, uh, then, as I said, things on wheel, first of all, on the road, then off road. Mm -hmm. No, definitely makes sense. Gilad, thank you. Um, actually, Ben is also saying that uh, backup generators are using this or sport and recreation vehicles as well. Um, so that's also a potential uh, attack target. Um, Bill is is asking, um, can, can uh, intrusion detection software be added to gateways of older models on the road to for today's solution? Okay, so uh, the answer is any good answer is yes and no. So the answer is yes, you can, given there are enough resources. So if we go to the aftermarket uh, and look at a vehicle that uh, has a gateway and the design was left with uh, enough space to uh, add at least a minimum, the, the IDS IPS can be modular. It doesn't have to be the full-fledged uh, solution with the most complex uh, detection algorithm, but uh, something is better than nothing. Uh, with the cooperation of the tier one and the OEM, we can run a auto campaign that will add the IDS IPS into those vehicles. Especially interesting, the fact that the uh, lifespan of heavy duty vehicle is much longer than um, passenger vehicles, so it makes more sense. And the second thing that makes sense is the fact that uh, many OEMs are sharing the same uh, ECUs, the same gateways uh, from uh, tier ones. That means that if we have a solution with one OEM, on one gateway, and that gateway is used by other OEMs, other vehicles, then we have the same solution for all of them. We just need to uh, launch an update with their each and one um, auto campaign uh, server. So the answer is yes, it can be done. Need to, if you have a special case, please see us and we can uh, go and look a bit deeper into the details and determine if it's feasible or not. Uh, in general, the form factor of the uh, IDS IPS in terms of uh, flash and uh, memory is very, very small, matter of just a few Ks, and uh, it does not add to the latency. Um, if we're in the intrusion prevention, obviously, if you're intrusion detection, there is no latency. But if we're in detection prevention, uh, even then we do not add latency, which is uh, outside of the uh, J1939 allowed delay on the bus. So we are keeping this in limit and we are not uh, harming the bus. So yes, it's possible and need on a per case basis to analyze it because there is no one medicine for all the diseases and we need to make sure that uh, the specific gateway from the specific uh, tier one, which fits in the specific OEM, uh, has the enough resources uh, in terms of CPU memory and uh, flash to accommodate our software. Okay, um, great. So um, actually, my I have a few more questions here. Um, first of all, for Gil. Um, I had a question regarding, um, so this this is a, a J an SAE J standard, right? So that means that the code base is not standard; only the requirements are, right? Yeah. And if so, the code that you reviewed, where is this code coming from? <clears throat> well, uh, in this case, this was off the internet. Um, this is not the only code we looked at. There are other other code we looked at. Um, you, you, be, you need to tread careful with these things, right? You know that uh, Microsoft has a policy called uh, Patch Tuesday, and then the hackers have a policy of uh, Exploit Wednesday. <laughs> so if I'm going to um, 
reveal right now which code it belongs to, then every hacker out there will try to use that. Uh, and that is, um, I mean, our, we, we don't hack for fun and profit, right? We uh, actually do it a bit more responsibly and either if a T1 or OEM thinks that he has a J939 code he uses, he's welcome to contact us or we'll contact him. Uh, specifically the code we looked at here, uh, we contacted the guy who wrote it. Uh, he did not want to be disclosed in any way, no joint PR, nothing, and we respect that. That's not a trivial thing to do. Uh, but the thing is that he did not fix his code. It's, the, it's still the same code I checked oh. in the beginning of the week. It's not fixed. Oh, and that's... if you think, this, this is, by the way, something that we see repeatedly. Uh, either do not disclose, uh, when we do, let's call it uh, voluntary hacks, not when we are paid by, uh, by an OEM or T1. When we do voluntary hacks and you contact whoever T1 or OEM owns, that owns the code and do not say anything. Okay, and uh, it's it's not even uh, even credit if they fix it. It's not something that they are uh, willing to speak about, and um, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, it is a challenge, but again, you need to do it responsibly. If we now disclose whatever uh, vulnerabilities we have, and as I said, there's a reason we call it uh, uh, let's call it a generic hacks we found. It's not just generic codes hacks in this code. We saw other pieces of code that. Probably, if a T1 OEM uses J9, J939, he has them, quite probably. I mean, he uses several systems. And it's not out there, it's not public yet. And in some, I mean, in some respect, the best thing you can do is contact them directly and not just publish, okay, we have a new zero day, uh, we can hack your systems and then wait for them to run around and see how they fix everything. Yeah, and that's not our intention yeah, at all. Yeah. In any case, we encourage T1 and OEMs that are using J1939 to approach us, uh, and then we can share more information again in a responsible fashion. Uh, Gil presented here a few of those vulnerabilities, which in our view are interesting for the presentation, but even if they are uh, exploited by someone, uh, no huge damage will be caused. We do have uh, more of them, which are uh, much more severe. And as Gil said, for responsible reasons, we do not share them in a public uh, presentation. But we do do have them, and I do encourage and urge tier ones and OEMs to approach us. We'll be more than happy to share more information, more detailed information, uh, so they can check if they have this uh in their code or not and as gil said it's not our business to do hacking and we're not um doing this for money so uh, obviously all this will be provided free of charge uh, as a goodwill with the target to improve the security and safety of the automotive industry uh, yeah, but actually, i'm not going to do it Actually, I was referring to another event when people hacked for fun and profit and uh, did some serious damage to the OEM. Uh, I was uh, subtle about it. We do not do that. We will not shame any OEM and T1 and make them uh, do a large recall. That's not our purpose. Even if that OEM uh, did some, has some uh, public code that is bad and is not even willing to take a responsibility for it. And we also have some of these. Well, and this is not the way, this is not the right way. This is, <laughs> this does a lot of damage to the industry. Right. And that's exactly what I, I would like to say as well, is that ASRG is not here to um, give vulnerabilities to the world. We're here to try and to stop this and bring it to everybody's attention <clears throat> that, that paying attention to your code, to following the correct procedures and, and incorporating all of these lessons learned into your development cycle so that you do not have these types of issues in the field. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So it's really important that, you know, Gilad and Gil, that when you do research like this, bringing this stuff forward so that people can learn from other people's mistakes. That's great. 
Um, I, I do have some more questions if you guys have some more time. Um, the, Go ahead. <laughs> the, the next one is that these attacks would require physical access to the vehicle. Is that correct? No, definitely not. Uh, what Gil showed is the last part of the um, of the attack, and uh, there is no attack which is done in one phase. So there would probably be a, a, a previous phases in which, through the connected vehicle, uh, connected devices, connected issue, we would get uh, to the vehicle. Another thing which uh, is in concept is that the M enemy is among us. That means that our basic assumption, the opening uh, point of any protection uh, system is that uh, the enemy is already here. And we cannot have, we, we need to build a defense in depth approach in which there are quite a few layers of protection. Um, because we know that every layer of protection can eventually be breached. But if you build a few of them, uh, that that should be a good uh, approach. So now, yes, you can perform those attacks with physical access, obviously it's easier, but the assumption is uh, no, you don't. You can do it remotely. In terms of the security level that you need, you don't need an infinite level of protection, the same as with your uh, door. You don't have to have your best uh, lock in the world. You just need to be a bit more hard to pick than your neighbor. And then the thief will go to the neighbor. So you don't need a perfect 100% um, non-hackable system. You need a good enough system that will deter the intruder uh, from further trying to attack. So defense in depth is the prescribed uh, approach, starting with secure design and uh, secure boot and uh, IDS IPS yeah. and host IDS and other uh, other co uh, endpoint protection. Uh, all those things are part of the security cryptography, obviously. Uh, but the assumption, the basic assumption, is that uh, the intruder is already there, not necessarily through a physical access, but mainly through the uh, remote access, because this way, one of the basics of hacking is cover your tracks. And to cover your tracks, if you have physical attack uh, access, it's much harder than remote access. Furthermore, if you have remote access, then you can attack a fleet. If you have physical access, then you can attack one vehicle. And yeah. we are, OEMs and nations are interested in protecting the fleet. Uh, by the way, the regulator is interested in protecting the individual vehicle. So, um, in any case, this 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 is the the position. Uh, well, I would like to add to that. There's something very special about the uh, this domain of J1939. Usually, for light vehicles, an attack from an aftermarket device is not a problem. I mean, it is a problem, but you ignore it. Here, by definition, you do a mix and match. Here, by definition, you're allowed and expected to put things in your vehicle, in your rig or truck that do not belong there and come from other vendors. And uh, with even if I don't need the, the if I, even if I don't have the wireless access, uh, supply chain attacks are a very very serious problem. Here, by definition, it is allowed. Uh, uh, it's not uh, if it if it's for the light vehicles. That's the uh, owner of the vehicle's problem that he did that. Uh, you should not put aftermarket devices. Here you should put them. And they can attack the rest of the vehicle. You do not, you do not know what you put there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I meant, you know, uh, yes, of course, if we're always looking at the complete attack chain, right? Um, this little part that we looked at today, though, is that we need access to that bus. Maybe it's not physical access. Maybe it's some kind of compromised device, but... That that device, or we need somehow access to that bus to to uh, do the buffer overflows or um, manipulate the the SYN messages and so on. 
or right if, okay. if you remember my a previous uh, session that i gave was protecting the tcu uh, mm -hmm. the reason you need to protect the tcu because this is the entry point into the vehicle so if there is no protection in the of the tcu you might have a chance to gain access to the vehicle and phase two is to launch the attack of one of the, the attacks that uh, Gil um, presented. So the attack vector, the kill chain is a chain, it's not a uh, one step attack. And no. the TCU or the V2X are definitely the uh, weapons of choice and the attack surface that I would attack because I can attack this way the fleet and I can do it uh, from any place uh around the globe uh, yeah. and with a full capability to cover my tracks or even if they find me probably i'm in uh countries in which you cannot uh harm me yeah. but let's... In which countries. <laughs> well, once you're allowed to fly yeah <laughs> yeah that's right um all right i think we have time for one last question and i think this is really an interesting question um is so is this a possible to detect in, in real time, so in operation? Next time we do a real-time demo, um, we don't did not plan and we did not have the time to show a, uh, a demonstration. But if you'll find us a slot until August, we'll be more than happy to demonstrate uh, both automotive Ethernet, CAN bus, and uh, J1939 uh, um, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention in real time, running on chips like uh, ST Microelectronics. I'm not doing here any uh, advertising for any company uh, on Marvel chips. Uh, you can mm -hmm. think about more, more than one chip on which this works. This is basically an MC MCU running. ARM 7 with, uh, let's say, half gig of, of RAM and a few megs of uh, flash. Um, and this is not the only thing which is running. If I speak about the gateway, this is not the only thing that is running on the gateway. Yeah. So depending on the implementation, uh, for J1939 and uh, Canvas, this is a pure software uh, solution. Uh, for Ethernet, we're using also the switch capabilities such as uh, current queuing and uh, rate limiting and other other um, other means, but for J1939, it's pure software and it can be easily demonstrated with uh, timings of the incoming and outgoing uh, traffic. So we can put a protocol analyzer, a, uh, inject traffic of a PCAN or KNOE, whatever you want, and from the other side you can see that it's coming out uh, and you see logs of frames which were um, uh, dropped. Uh, we can hold another session about algorithms of how to do intrusion prevention, how we do correlation, how we do uh, signature based, how we do timing, how we do ranges. So, um, you, I, like that. I, I guess, I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> The, the short answer is yes, but okay. I never give short answers. <laughs> it's really important to understand that uh, um, this is, of course, something that can be identified and it, can it be mitigated in real time as well? So uh, Yes. 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 Look, look at all the uh, if you look technically at all the mitigations I gave, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is something you, look, you see at the communication level um, and it, is, it can be stopped there. Okay. I mean, it is something that is very clear. You know, we look at the number of frames and the size of the message. Don't send uh, 